Kia ora, good evening. Welcome to Central News for Friday the 2nd of May. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Mark down Friday the 30th of May in your calendar for Arbor Day 2014, planting at Waifakariki Natural Heritage Park. Community planting coordinator Gerard Kelly says it's been 10 years since the establishment of Waifakariki National Heritage Park and 150 years for Hamilton. So the council, of course, has a big celebration planned. The park's growing and we thought, well look, better, what better opportunity, the 10th year, let's plant, do a big massive planting. Um, last year we did one, we're going to try and top that. So we're going to actually, the challenge is to plant 30,000 native plants. Hunters are expected to enjoy a great start to the new game bird hunting season, which gets underway this Saturday. Although moderate to heavy rain has fallen in many areas, bringing favourable weather for hunting, hunters are urged to be ready to quickly adapt to changing conditions. Fish and Game Communications Advisor Andrew Curry says police officers will check firearms licences and other lawful behaviour. Depending on the circumstances, offenders risk fines of up to $100,000 and loss of any firearms used. Hunters are also encouraged to report any banded birds harvested along with band number, location and date recovered and their personal details to help fish and game monitor birds and ensure sustainable hunting in the future. Automotai College's robotics team is showing Kiwi ingenuity is world class after placing second at the VEX Robotics World Championship in Los Angeles. The high school team last night flew back to New Zealand following the three-day event at the Anaheim Convention Centre. More than 15,000 students from 27 countries take part in the competition with individually built robots. Automotai College fell one point short of taking the overall honours with Auckland's Linfield College finishing first. The Algae Bloom Health warnings previously issued for Lake Rotuehu and for Okawa Bay and Okiri Arm on Lake Rotuiti have been lifted. Medical Officer of Health Dr Neil DeWatt says results of water testing by Blay Plenty Regional Council confirm that algae blooms have subsided in both these lakes. Despite the lifting of the warning, Dr DeWitt advises that the public should always be vigilant for signs of algal blooms if using lakes. In sport, the Chiefs' perfect record against the Lions will come under strong challenge after losing to the Brumbies last week in an away game. The team will relish being back in the atmosphere of loyal home ground support, though, as they line up for what shapes as a clash with massive implications for their season. The Lions come off their bye week to play the champions at Waikato Stadium this Saturday. Now for our region's marine forecast. West coast Raglan, tomorrow there is a variable 10 knots sea slight, southwest swell 1 metre and your high tide is at 12.41pm. To the other coast now, the east Bay Plenty, westerly 10 knots at times and 1.5 metres swell developing on Saturday, mainly fine. Your high tide is 10.05 in the morning. Sunday for you, West Coast, developing northerly, 15 knots, rising early Monday, 25 knots, but 35 knots offshore with a very rough sea, easing late Monday, northwest, 20 knots everywhere. Moderate northwest swell developing on Sunday and Monday. High tide on Sunday is 1.24 p.m. East Coast, variable 5 knots, becoming northerly, 10 knots late, and a few cloudy periods. High tide is at 10.49 a.m. Just ahead, we catch up with the Waipa Mayor. Welcome to Central News. Just a month ago, Te Aumutu was seeing an increase in visitors to the only legal high shop after Hamilton shops had their interim licences suspended. Now the government has announced the withdrawal of these substances from May the 8th until they can be proven safe. Anne-Marie spoke with Mayor Waipa District Jim Milcrest to find out what this now means for the council. Oh well at, at the moment it's an interim ban of course so the legislation although uh, it still stands but effectively they've just taken off all of the psychoactive substances that uh, were perceived to be of low risk um, but you know from Tiamutu's perspective we certainly picked up on a lot of the uh, users from from Hamilton which was uh, pretty dramatic and I suppose in some ways uh, Served the purpose of making government aware of the problem that was actually out there. 
but it really is um, the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff mentality from my point of view and from councils and uh, you know we certainly didn't want all of those people coming into town but that really is a minor issue in terms of what we need to deal with it's it's the fact that these uh, people are taking the drugs whether it's through complete um, I suppose desperation or else it's uh, a as they say, recreational experiment has gone wrong, but one way or another they're addictive and they're really harmful, and it's a really soft option in my view to actually just say that uh, they're, they're legal and that people should be able to buy them from effectively what looks like a dairy. The fallout from the legislation was basically left to the councils to figure out. Should the government have acted earlier? Oh, absolutely, but um, I, you know, even if you talk to the members of, of Parliament, they're all of the same frame of mind, I suppose, that local councils are. They want the things out of the uh, uh, out of circulation. Um, they just don't know how to do it, and it just doesn't seem logical to me, and and again to our council, that you say that these substances are are, are safe. Um, we're going to ask people to prove that they're safe and then really require a licence to sell them. Where's the logic in that? What's the next step with regards to the local puff shops? Do you continue on with legislation? Oh, we, we need to stick with what we've done in terms of our policy. Um, it may well be challenged because, of course, um, central government was saying that the councils were being tardy and that they could pass policies that would actually prohibit the sale of the uh, drugs from within their towns. Now, that that's completely incorrect because when a statute is passed by central government, uh, uh, either an act or a regulation, um, councils don't have the power to, um, I suppose, um, try and get around that legislation by passing policies and bylaws. So we actually have to act within the powers that are given to us. So the expectation was from those regulations that there would be places available for this stuff to be sold. So it's not, it's not a uh, situation where the councils could control it. And, and now we're facing legal challenges and every council that has passed a bylaw will in fact be up for that cost. Field Days was first held at Te Rapa Racecourse in 1969 and attracted an estimated 15,000 people. Today they are the biggest agricultural field days in the Southern Hemisphere and attract over 120,000 visitors from an average of 38 countries over the four days they are held at Mystery Creek. Anne-Marie spoke with Field Days event executive Michael Hall to find out what's in store for Field Days 2014. Visitors can expect to see a whole lot more this year. The site's even bigger. We've created another 28 new sites this year just purely through demand from exhibitors to be here. We've also seen that uh, there's a lot more interactivity. The activities we have on site and also the activities that the exhibitors are running um, are so much more based around the visitors getting involved, getting some food in their mouth, getting in, getting their hands dirty. So there's going to be a lot of fun to have um, over the four days. How many sites in total now? We're up to uh, 1,300 exhibitor sites with over 900 uh, exhibitors taking those spaces. So there's so much to see, a lot of bargains and definitely a lot of deals to be, to be done. As always, there'll be innovations and competitions, and the Field Days Ag Artwear competition is in its 20th year. It's stronger than ever, and you've got a gala dinner this year. That's right, yeah, we're celebrating the 20th year this year. Uh, we've brought on Anna Stretton as the head judge, which is going to take the competition to a whole new level. She's incredibly experienced and well-rounded in that fashion circle. She's got over uh, uh, 210,000 likes, followers on, online. She's got 30 stores and she's written three books. So she's got a really sharp eye and it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays in the competition. We'll be holding a gala dinner in Hamilton City at the Clarence Street Theatre. Uh, that will be on Friday the 13th. Um, of June on the, in, uh, during the night and tickets are available for that at the moment on Ticketek. Innovation really sums up what the field days are all about. Tell me about the Innovation Awards and the Innovation Centre at the actual field days. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, innovation is one of the cornerstones of, of field days and of the event and we're incredibly passionate about it. The Innovation Centre has actually grown this year so we've partnered with Vodafone again this year um, in the innovation sector and so we've got uh, more space. Last year we had 75 entrants and we're hoping to hit around the 90 mark this year. 
We've got uh, some returning some returning entrants, which we're really keen to see come back. They entered last year with some prototypes and some ideas, and they had such a massive, um, overwhelming positive feedback that they've actually spent the entire year developing those ideas, and they're now ready for sale, and they'll be launching them at field days this year. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, we've also got the Innovation Den, which will be coming back for the second year now. We introduced that last year. Uh, and that'll see eight of the entrants pitching to a room of investors um, looking, looking for investment. Um, and we'll be streaming that back down to the site for visitors to watch. I understand you'll also be searching for the 2014 Rural Bachelor of the Year as well. We will, and that's always a popular competition. We'll be looking for eight rural bachelors that will be competing um, at the competition here on site. Six New Zealanders and also two Aussies. Yeah, they'll be doing, they'll be doing more activities. They'll be, they'll be doing tractor pull, um, fencing, and also high tea and speed dating uh, for any of the lucky ladies walking around the event, you know, looking to come and meet the talent. So it's going to be yeah, good to watch. Field Days 2014 runs from the 11th to the 14th of June and, of course, at Mystery Creek Event Centre. Coming up after the break, Hamilton City Council's legal high fight. Welcome back. This week the government announced plans to withdraw legal highs from sale until manufacturers can prove they are safe. Effectively, a ban. Anne-Marie spoke with Hamilton City Councillor Angela O'Leary to find out what this means for Hamilton City Council. So it doesn't actually mean anything for us at the moment um, because that ban is about the remaining 40 products that, that uh, legal high retailers were allowed to sell. Um, they haven't said that we can't sell any in New Zealand at all. So that's something that they need to work out and our policy is just is still just remains um, effective and we will wait for the legislation to, to follow. The legislation basically left councils to figure out a way forward, didn't it? Ye yes, it did. And I hope that in, in this announcement the government's made that this will give them time um, to, to take a pause and to, to talk to councils and to talk to the health sector because they're the ones going to be picking up the pieces shortly um, and to talk to the police and, and just take their time to, to really get this legislation right because it, it, it's just not right as it is at the moment. An appeal is currently underway regarding the council's psychoactive substances proposal. Does this still have to be seen through? Well, that's, uh, we haven't had any indication from the Star Trust that they are changing that, so, and that would be up, up to them to, to make that decision. So at the moment, the case is still going forward. Why has the government made this decision now? Is it bowing to community pressure, or is it, as some say, because it's an election year? Look, I think it's all of those things, um, and it's, it, it, I think that they have come to the conclusion, as the minister said this week, uh, that they did actually get this one wrong and um, they're going to have to take the time now to, to, to find out the right way forward. But yes, of course, an election year helps, doesn't it? Do you think the government should have taken a stronger stance sooner? I personally do think that. That is my personal opinion. Um, but I guess uh, these things happen over time, and, and the community has been very strong in their views, and the media particularly has been are very good at showing the, the very real effects of, of these products out on the street and out in the community. So I think it's, it's the only sensible decision that government could have made, I believe. What about the addicts? Who's going to be left dealing with them now? So I think that that's, uh, that's certainly something for the health sector. Um, and I know that they are you know, currently talking out, out in public about, look, they don't, they're not going to have the resources. You know, if you stop supply of something that people are addicted to, uh, there's going to be some serious consequences. So I think the government needs to be, be seriously looking at the Ministry of Health and what, how they can uh, handle that because, look, I, you know, I don't know what's going to be happening on the streets and, and next week when suddenly a supply of of an addictive substance is cut off, I, I, I don't know what will happen there. Time travel, bats and tween culture. An odd mixture, but are all part of many lecture topics to be featured at this year's University of Waikato Open Day. The annual event is free and open to the public. Cynthia McNabb, Student Recruitment Advisor from the University, spoke with Anne-Marie to explain what the day is designed to showcase. Anyone can attend the Open Day on the 16th. Um, it is based largely for high school students, so we have a lot of schools coming from as far away as Northland or Gisborne or Taranaki. 
Um, so we'll have about 3,500 students on campus for that day. The general public is more than welcome to attend and if they don't want to come on the same day as all the school students, they can come on Community Open Day, which is the following um, Saturday the 17th of May. And what can people expect to see? On the 16th there'll be heaps of lectures, heaps of things going on campus. So every department, every faculty have got different people who are giving short mini lectures, which are about 25 minutes long and they're of topics that are really interesting to the students so that we can get that level of engagement for them. And then aside from that there'll be free food all over the campus which is always a winner and lots of fun activities for the kids to participate in. Will the open day help people who are undecided about what courses to take? Absolutely, we encourage people who are maybe choosing between us and a couple of other institutions or who have no idea to come along and have a look. It can often be quite helpful to even get onto a university campus so that you have a picture in your mind of what university is like and what lecturers are like and what it's like to actually sit and be a student. And for people who are wanting specific course information, everybody who is involved in that is on hand to help as well. Is the open day just for school leavers? People who aren't school leavers we'd probably encourage to come along to the community open day on the 17th and that's just simply because it's more based around um, that community feel and people who have been away from study or away from school for a couple of years so they can get a feel for what it's going to be like to transition back to study from being in the workplace or being away having a family. What about those considering the mid-year intake? Absolutely, our July intake, uh, 14th of July is our July intake beginning um, and for people who are making those last minute decisions, absolutely the right time to come along. Tell me about some of the mini lecture subjects. Time travel? Time travel, bats, what's Gen Y up to, there's a huge range. Um, as I said before, it's all the different faculties um, bringing all their information in. So that's all the brand new research that's coming out, all the interesting and intriguing topics. Um, so it doesn't matter what you're into, we've got something on campus for you. You mentioned people will be on campus to speak with. Do they need to make appointments? No, they don't need to make appointments. So the lecturers will be giving their mini lectures and then each faculty um, there'll be presentations and um, stands and lecturers and tutors are there available to ask the questions. And we recruitment advisors will be on campus running around ask, answering any questions that anyone's got all day. The University of Waikato Open Day is on Friday the 16th of May and runs from 9am to 2pm. For more details, go to waikato.ac.nz. Coming up after the break, your weather for the weekend. If you have just joined us, welcome to Central News. After 10 years in Europe, a local Waikato businessman is bringing part of the business back to the Waikato. Anne-Marie spoke with the commercial director to find out more about Forest Forex. Forest Forex is part of the Forest Group and it's our international money transfers business. So it's looking at helping anyone that has a need to send currency overseas, uh, whether they're an individual or a small to medium business uh, who is buying from suppliers overseas, for example, and needing to pay them in their foreign currency. How are they currently doing that? By and large, um, here in Australasia, uh, people just use their banks and really that's just about the worst way you can do it. So for a long time the banks have been taking a, a hidden margin if you like um, and there hasn't been any need for them to compete to offer a better service or better rates because it's just the way it's done, it's a basic service. What do you offer that's different from traditional banks and even the Western Union? I think it's the willingness to compete, so it's, it's about using clever technology and challenging the status quo, um, being really service driven and uh, really pushing those big players hard um, to compete on the rates. How does the money transfer take place? That's a really good question um, and this is where I guess our, our technology really comes into play. Um, so let's say you need to be paying $100,000 to a Japanese supplier, you need to send them some yen. Rather than actually taking your New Zealand dollars and converting them to pay out in Japan, uh, think of it this way, we've got a pot of money at each end of the transaction, um, you're paying into a local Kiwi dollar account and then we pay out on the other side in the local currency. Um, it means that we're not actually doing a conversion as such. Those, those funds are waiting there to be paid out. So it makes it a lot cheaper and it also makes it uh, quite a bit faster. 
Is it safe? It is safe, yeah. So we're highly regulated. This isn't the sort of business you can just get into overnight, unfortunately. Um, we're an ICAEW member firm and we're also regulated by the FCA, that's the Financial Conduct Authority. So it's a really highly regulated space and the technology that we're using to do these transfers um, already has half a million customers globally. Why have you chosen Hamilton? Another good question and uh, that's one that uh, a lot of people have asked. They've said, you know, obviously it should be Auckland for, for this sort of business and I think Auckland um, maybe has more of a reputation and, and possibly a more glamorous um, shop window if you like, um, but you really can't discount the amount of business that's being done in the Waikato um, with that really strong agricultural engine um, that's, that's driving a, a whole lot of business. What have you learnt from your last 10 years in Europe that you'll be bringing back to New Zealand? Some pretty big lessons, um, and I think you know, 10 years in somewhere like the City of London uh, can give you some pretty sharp teeth. Um, and you know, we've been fortunate to to work with some pretty big players over there. So, I guess a, an expanded view on things, a global mindset, um, and those qualifications that I mentioned before. Um, are really, those are some of the things that that we're going to bring back. And. Um, you couple that with the good old Kiwi number eight wire attitude and that ability to just get things done and it's, uh, it's a pretty potent combination. For more details on Forest Forex, go to forest-group.co.uk. Right, it is time for the weekend weather. Oh, I think it is time for the winter sheets, everybody. Hamilton, your Saturday will be fine with light winds and an expected high of 20 and an overnight low of 12. Pairoa, cloudy periods with a chance of a bit of drizzly rain, 21 and 10 your temperatures. Matamata the same with 18 and 10. Te Aumutu and Tokoroa, the same for you too, cloudy periods with patches of drizzle. 20 and 8 for you Te Aumutu and Tokoroa and 17 and there's that 8 again. Tauranga, your Saturday is fine with light winds, 20 and 12. Tapuki, you are the same with 18 and 11. Looking at Sunday now, Hamilton, the same as your Saturday apparently. Cloudy periods, slight winds, expected high 21 and 11. Sunday for you, Paeroa, cloudy periods, early drizzle patches, light winds and 21 and 12. The same for the rest of the Waikato, a drizzly day, Matamata 18 and 12. Te Aumutu 17 and you get that overnight low of 8 again. Tokoroa 18 and 10. Tauranga 21 and 15, cloudy periods with light winds for your Sunday. But Tapuki, you get the drizzle like most of the Waikato, but it will be later as it moves across. Your expected high is 19 and an overnight low of 14. That is central news for today and this week. Remember to like us on Facebook or email us at news at tvcentral.co.nz. We love hearing your feedback. Join us again next week where we take a look, closer look at the synthetic cannabis issue in our communities and we feature some of our very talented local musicians for New Zealand Music Month. I'm Hilary Entwistle. I hope you have a lovely evening and a fantastic weekend. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.